Hey, everyone. Can everyone hear, hear me all right? Cool. I'm just going to set up. Um, it's really an honor to be the opening keynote at Tech Summit Amsterdam. Um, I just flew in from New York yesterday, so forgive me if I'm a little uh, jet lagged and loopy. <laughs> um, so my name is Alex Chin, and the title of this talk is Shaving My Head Made Me a Better Programmer. And uh, I apologize in advance for, um, there's a few American nerd pop culture references, so it's okay if you don't laugh at all my jokes. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm a software engineer and an educator, and I really care about access to computer science education and about leveraging technology to create positive social change. And I'm going to tell the story of how that happened and what I learned along the way. So I'm originally from Paris, France. Bonjour. Um, and I moved to the United States to go to college, and I live in Brooklyn now. Um, and I started programming in university. I wanted to be an astronaut, and I joined the engineering program at my school. And one of the requirements for the program was intro to programming, and I fell in love with it immediately. It was like nothing I'd ever experienced. I felt like I could be creative and analytical at the same time. I felt like I'd finally found an art form with which I could express myself. So I started programming and I decided to major in computer science and that was a really easy decision, but um, staying in computer science was not as easy. And, you know, learning to code is hard, but um, the reason why it was hard for me wasn't because the actual act of learning to program is hard. Um, yes, that was hard, it's a lot of dealing with frustrations, a lot of dealing with your computer telling you you failed over and over again, um, but that wasn't the hard part. The hard part, um, the main obstacles that I had to overcome were other people's perceptions and my own perceptions about my abilities as a programmer. I'm gonna let this GIF finish because it's cute. Um, and so at that time, I was maybe one of five women in my computer science classes. There were some classes where I was the only woman. And similarly, there were really few other students in my classes who hadn't been programming since they were 10 and whose parents weren't software engineers. And so even though I did really well in all my classes and got good grades, no one really wanted to work with me. Uh, no one wanted to interact with me on an intellectual level. Uh, it was really tough and lonely. And it felt like being hyper-visible and invisible at the same time. People didn't really believe I was a programmer. They would ask me, like, are you sure? Prove it. Do you know what a terminal is? Um, which is a ridiculous question. But it wasn't just them. I didn't believe it myself. Like, until senior year of college, for example, when people asked me if I was a programmer, I'd say, you know, not really. I'm trying to become one, which is kind of silly because the act of programming is what makes you a programmer. And so there were two things going on there. There were people discriminating against me because I didn't look like what a programmer should look like, and there was my own imposter syndrome. And for those of us who aren't familiar, imposter syndrome is when someone feels like a failure or a fraud, um, even though they're doing great, and I'll talk more about this later. Um, but I'm really stubborn, so I decided even though it was hard and people didn't want me around, that I was going to become a good programmer in a way that would be unquestionable to the world. So I joined the programming team and became a leader from our, for our school's computer club, and I took all the hardest computer science classes and had all these like motivational posters up in my dorm. And I won a bunch of hackathons, and I finally became accepted by my peers. And it's kind of ridiculous that for other people, all they had to do was show up and look nerdy, and I had to, you know, accomplish all this other stuff, but I made it, so it didn't seem to matter anymore. So then I graduated um, from college with a computer science degree, and I was really proud, and I got my first full-time job as a programmer at a startup in New York. And it was a really awesome job. I was a front-end engineer. I learned a ton. I made lifelong friends. I got to be a part of a really small team and have a huge impact on the product and all aspects of the company. And that was awesome. But one thing that wasn't so awesome was whenever I stepped out of my great job bubble, and entered the tech world, like went to conferences or tech meetups or events, and as our company 
grew and we hired more people, that same stuff that happened to me in university happened to me all over again, like everywhere I went. Um, and some of it was small stuff like microaggressions, like people asking me over and over if I was sure I was a programmer, and also some bigger, scarier, more serious stuff. And it became so prevalent at some point that I became really discouraged. And I felt like, why do I love programming if programming doesn't love me back? And I was just trying to do my job, you know, I was just trying to write code. And my environment wasn't really allowing me to. And I seriously considered quitting programming and becoming one of the 50% of women who leave software at some point in their careers. But as I said before, I'm really stubborn. So again, I tried to find a solution to my problem. I sought out my friends for advice, and I actually realized that um, I only had male programmer friends. Um, and so I asked them to introduce me to women who were programmers at their tech companies. And um, so they introduced me, and I went on blind coffee dates with a bunch of lady programmers. And some of them became really great friends. And at the time, what I was really looking for was for advice from people who'd had the same experience as me, but also to create a support network. And so I'd ask these women, like, you know, what do I do? How do I deal with the way I'm being treated in this profession? And I got a lot of different pieces of advice. Some was helpful, some was less helpful. Everyone really sympathized with me and everyone, you know, knew what I was going through. And I remember there was this one woman, she'd been a software engineer for of over 10 years. She told me when she cut her hair short, she stopped getting sexually harassed at tech events. And I didn't really think about that. I was like, okay, that's not that helpful. Um, and then I had uh, another friend um, who was a guy who was really trying to help, and he told me, why don't you become a badass programmer, like this one famous female programmer, um, and people will have to take you seriously. Like, if you become known for your expertise, then people won't have a choice but to give you respect. So that was like, okay, like, maybe I'll try that. And so I started giving talks at meetups about something I'm really passionate about, which is accessibility on the web. And that's the concept of making the web accessible to people with disabilities, blind people, people who can't use a mouse, the elderly. And it went really well. And after a while, I even got invited to speak at a really big programming conference where people were flying in from all over the country to attend. And tickets cost hundreds of dollars. And I got to share the stage with people that I really respected, people who built the tools that I used every day to code. And I was certainly the youngest person on stage, and so I was really excited. I felt accomplished. It was a big deal. I was badass. And so I gave my talk, and it went really great, and people learned about the important things that I had to say about accessibility, and I felt really good about it. Um, but then the first thing I got asked after my talk was, this guy asked me, how do I talk to women at bars? And I couldn't believe it, because after all the work that I'd done to get there, even in the moment where my expertise was undeniable, like I was literally on stage at this conference that he paid money to attend, teaching him things, even then I wasn't seen as a programmer. And so I learned in that moment that being a badass doesn't help. Like I still don't get any respect. And at this point I'm really angry. Like this motivational poster lied to me. And I'm so sick of being treated this way because of my appearance. But I'm a hacker, so I decide I'm going to hack my appearance. So I decided to shave my head. And this was before Stranger Things, so it wasn't as cool then. Um, but so I shaved my head, and the weirdest thing happened. Like, suddenly, overnight, I was a really good programmer. And I stopped getting hit on at tech conferences, and people listened to me and respected me and stopped doubting me. I stopped being this mix of hypersexualized and underskilled programmer, and I would walk into a room filled with other programmers, and they'd look to me for expertise and say things like, oh, you're technical, what do you think of this problem? And I couldn't believe it because it was the first time that this was happening to me. And so I tried to think about this scientifically, like, is there something in hair that makes you bad at being a programmer? Like, maybe my hair was weighing me down, weighing, dragging my programming skills down. Um, but no, that wasn't the case because this guy is a really good programmer. Um, that's Richard Stallman. <laughs> um, he's the founder of the free software movement. And then this guy is also a really good programmer. Um, and then this is Serial from the movie Hackers, and he's a great programmer. Um, and if you haven't seen this movie, you should watch it. It's amazing. 
Um, and so it really didn't have to do with my hair. But now I was suddenly considered to be a good programmer. And what had changed? It wasn't my abilities, like they hadn't changed overnight. It was the way that I was being perceived by my peers. I was no longer this really high, um, hyper feminine lady who didn't really belong in the community. I didn't look very feminine anymore. I dressed kind of androgynously at the time to match my look and people even mistook me and my boyfriend for a gay couple once. And so I didn't present as feminine anymore. And thusly, it was okay for me to be a programmer and even a good one. And this was a mind-blowing discovery for me because even though I knew I was a good programmer and I knew about sexism in the tech industry, now I had proof of this on a really personal level. And so I did a lot more thinking about this and you know, I knew there was a problem in my environment that doesn't allow capable, passionate people like me to succeed regardless of their abilities. And so I thought, you know, what can I do to fix this? And I decided I'm going to teach and mentor other people who don't fit the status quo, who don't look like what a programmer looks like, so that at a certain point, they will be able to change the status quo when there's enough of us in the industry who don't look like a traditional programmer. And then you won't be able to say that person shouldn't code. So I started teaching on the side as a volunteer at first. I taught high school kids at this school for immigrants in the Bronx. That's what this photo's from. I taught a lot of workshops for women and specifically women of color. And I, I found a real passion for teaching and education. So I decided to stop writing code full time. And I joined um, this programming school as the curriculum director. It was called Coalition for Queens and it was a free intensive um, programming school for adults from underrepresented backgrounds in tech. And I was hired to help launch the program, and we had a really successful pilot class. 50% of the class were women, 50% were immigrants, 50% didn't have a college degree, 50% were black and Latino, and the average income of the class coming in was around $25,000 a year. And after we finished um, the pilot, the graduates went on to become full-time software engineers at companies like Pinterest, Spotify, BuzzFeed, and some of them now make upwards of $120,000 a year, and that's life-changing. And throughout this process, I learned the most important lesson about teaching and about programming, which is we need to stop thinking there's only one type of person who can be ec an excellent programmer. Greatness in programming can come from anywhere, and anyone can achieve excellence if they're given support, a safe space to learn, and if you give them your trust and you trust that they can succeed. And since um, the pilot for Coalition for Queens ended, I decided to broaden my impact on education, which is why I joined Skillshare. Um, Skillshare is a continuing education platform that aims to help people learn new skills and grow their careers, and I lead the web engineering team there. As a teacher, I really believed and hoped that there was a way to create diverse environments in software, and at Skillshare, I've actually seen it in practice. Before working at Skillshare, I'd only ever been um, the only female on engineering teams, and when I joined Skillshare, we were two, and now I'm really excited to say that we have a 40% women engineering team, and 60% of the team are actually people of color, which is amazing. And it's taken a lot of commitment to create an environment where everyone is empowered and able to succeed, and it's a continuous process, and I'm really proud of the work we've done, and I'll talk a little bit more about it in a minute. Um, and outside of work, I continue to teach children and adults from underrepresented backgrounds to code. And I've recently started my own educational project called the Code Cooperative, in which former inmates learn to code as a means to creating social change. And it's a free, collaborative, student-led experience. And all the students were recently released from prison, and most of them, they had been in prison for a long time. And They've all been working on projects that highlight issues that they've experienced within the US criminal justice system with the aim of solving them. And so the bulk of my work today is really um, at the intersection of software, education, and access. I spend like most of my time leading the web engineering team at Skillshare where we work to forward continuing education all the while building a diverse team. Um, I spend the rest of my time teach teaching people from underrepresented backgrounds to code and I spend the other third of my time speaking about tech's lack of diversity and why it matters. And throughout my work, I've learned a lot about the tech community's 
um, issues of lack of diversity, and I've spent a lot of time building inclusive environments where people from all backgrounds can succeed, and I want to share some of those learnings with you now. Um, so you may have noticed there's a lot of talk about tech's lack of diversity going on right now. For example, Google just published their latest diversity report, and after two years and a quarter of a billion dollars, they admitted that they didn't make any significant progress in terms of racial diversity. Um, only 2% of their workforce is black, compared to 13% in the United States. And that number didn't change after two years and a quarter of a billion dollars, which almost seems impossible. Google was also recently accused by the U.S. Department of Labor of extremely and systemically underpaying women, and to which they responded, it's too expensive to gather that data. Um, they didn't even say it's too expensive to pay women equally. They said it's too expensive to even try. Um, or take Uber, for example, who has recently come under fire for allegations of sexual assault, sorry, harassment from one of their senior software engineers, Susan Fowler. It's a huge scandal, and it's having a disastrous impact on Uber's brand and company. Uber had to launch an internal investigation. Some Uber investors have written publicly about how disappointed they are. Other women who work at Uber have come forward with similar stories. The hashtag delete Uber movement was revived and has had a significant impact on app usage. And hundreds of many really high-level employees have quit or been fired, including the president of Uber, which has made Travis really sad. Um, and this has helped spark a national and even worldwide conversation about tech's diversity problems. And almost everyone I talk to really cares about it and about fixing it. But there's a lot of confusion about how to even approach talking about fixing tech's diversity issue. And for most people, it can be a really stressful topic. And so I want to spend some time demystifying it today. So we know diversity is clearly an important issue. And as members of the community, we should care about it. But why? Um, here are some bad reasons to care. Because you have to, because of PR, or because it's charitable. These reasons aren't great because when it comes down to making any kind of difficult decision, these don't really matter. Um, but there are quite a few really good reasons to care. Like maybe you want to make a lot of money. Studies have shown that diverse teams drive more innovation, are more successful, and ultimately make more money. Diverse companies significantly outperform non-diverse companies, and a McKinsey report showed a linear relationship between racial diversity and a company's financial performance. A study by Intel and Dalbert found that the tech industry could generate an additional 300 to 370 billion dollars each year if the racial diversity of tech companies reflected that of the talent pool. 300 to 370 billion dollars a year is a lot of money. Another good reason to care about diversity is that you want to build the best team. When you build your, your culture for inclusion, you are able to attract the most talented people for their job. Top candidates want to join diverse companies that foster equality. And we can build better teams if we hire from diverse pools because those pools are untapped. Another great reason to care is that you want to build a great product. In the tech industry, we want to solve the world's biggest problems. And so our teams need to reflect the populations that we aim to serve, because those who experience problems are the best equipped to solve them. Homogenous teams can lead to severe blind spots, like when Apple Maps launched without public transportation, or Apple Health launched without menstrual cycle tracking. Like, clearly, there wasn't a poor person or a woman on that team. Um, or more seriously, Google Photos launched with image recognition that labeled pictures of black people as gorillas. And in an even more serious case, the first airbags weren't tested with women's frames, so they ended up killing a bunch of women. And all of these errors could have been avoided if the teams had people from different backgrounds with different perspectives. And then this is probably the most important reason to care about um, diversity in tech, because you care about equality. And hopefully this is true for all of us. Outside of just being a product and business necessity, we need to acknowledge that the lack of diversity in tech is a symptom of inequality. And if we care about equality, we need to do our best to counteract it. So now we know that we care about tech's lack of diversity. How do we begin to fix it? One of the most important rules of software, which we forget like 99% of the time, is that you need to understand a problem in order to fix it. So why is there a lack of diversity in software? Women actually invented computer science and were the first programmers. Um, but in the 80s, there was a huge drop in women programming. And 
the share of women in computer science started falling roughly at the same moment as personal computers started showing up in US homes in significant numbers. And these early personal computers, they were kind of like toys. You could play Pong and simple shooting games and do some word processing. And so they were really marketed almost entirely to men and boys. And so the idea that computers are for boys became this narrative. It became the story that we told ourselves about the computing revolution. And it helped define who geeks were, and it created the techie culture. So the image of the boy genius programmer emerged. And this led to a culture of systemic discrimination in software. And what this means is that there are these invisible hurdles every step of the way that make it harder for certain groups of people to enter and succeed in software. So in the US, people who aren't white and Asian men are heavily discouraged from studying computer science and are often prevented from succeeding once they enter um, that career path. And that's exemplified by my story. Even though I was really passionate about computer science and excelled at it, I was discouraged by my classmates, my professors, potential employers, colleagues, and I was almost convinced to quit multiple times. And the important thing to remember is that systemic discrimination has an impact on every step of the, of the way. And so lack of diversity in tech isn't only because of the pipeline problem. A lot of people talk about the pipeline problem when talking about tech's lack of diversity. And it refers to the notion that diversity in tech exists because of the lack of qualified candidates. And so people will say things like, I'd love to have more women in tech, but there just aren't that many who are interested in this. But this isn't true, and it's been debunked over and over again. And as we talked about earlier, actually, in the 80s, women held like almost 40% of computer science degrees, and it has dropped to about 18% today. Women have always been interested in computer science. Um, but they, they even invented computer science, but they've been pushed out. And now, over 40% of women leave the field at some point in their career. Similarly, in the US, 18% of computer science graduates are black and Latino, but only 5% of the programming workforces. Some have used this pipeline metaphor to describe how women and other minorities get pushed out of technology, and it's referred to as the leaky pipeline. So we know where this culture originated, and we know certain groups of people aren't just worse at programming or less interested. And how do we begin to talk about diversity productively? It can be a really stressful and uncomfortable topic. Like one thing that really helps is knowing the language of diversity. So we can do a quick vocabulary check. A diverse environment is one where people from all backgrounds are represented. And an inclusive environment is one where people from all backgrounds receive equal treatment and equal opportunity by design. And this difference is important. Learning the language of inclusion has really been empowering for me because it's helped me name some of the experiences I've had. So earlier in my talk, I mentioned, you know, when I first started studying computer science and doing well in all my classes and, you know, I was super passionate about it. When people asked me if I was a programmer, I'd say no. And that was an example of imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is a collection of feelings of inadequacy that persist even though you're successful. And it's an incorrect assessment of, someone, of one's ability. So you might think that you're a three at programming when you're actually a seven. And you might think that you're a fraud, that you're constantly gonna be found out. And everyone can suffer from imposter syndrome, but it's much more prevalent in members of minority groups. And it can have a pretty devastating impact on someone's career. It can lead people to not apply for jobs or promotions, to not submit papers to conferences, to understate their experience and skills, to higher stress, and to being nervous about talking to others in the field. Like I remember when I first go started going to tech conferences, I didn't talk to anyone because I was so nervous about everyone in the room being smarter than me. And imposter syndrome occurs not just because someone is lacking confidence. A lot of the time, it's a reaction to being consistently told that you're not good enough. So we can't blame people who have imposter syndrome and just tell them to lean in. Because it's really difficult to build confidence when you're consistently given signals that you shouldn't be. Earlier in my talk, I mentioned people not believing I was a programmer, you know, asking me over and over, like, are you sure? Do you know what a terminal is? And that was an example of what is called unconscious bias. And it's really uh, at the root of why much discrimination happens in our lives. Unconscious biases form from messages we've received throughout our life and don't necessarily reflect our belief system. Almost everyone has biases, but almost no one thinks they do. Biases are like mental shortcuts for situations that we experience every day. 
And most of the time, we actively have to work against them. So if you're tired or hungry or multitasking, it's hard for you to work against your unconscious biases. And we can have unconscious biases against groups we belong to. Like when I first started out in my career, if I was at a tech event and I saw other women, I assumed they weren't technical, which makes no sense. Um, and another um, example, a study was conducted where science faculty were asked to evaluate job applications for lab managers where the only variance was, was the gender in the name. Both male and female faculty rated male applicants more highly and gave higher salaries to the men by $3,000, even though it was literally the same job application. And so the first step in addressing our biases is to be aware of them. So I encourage everyone to go take this project implicit test made by Harvard University to find out more about yours. Um, another thing that I experienced a lot throughout my career is microaggressions. And there are small, subtle, often subconscious actions that marginalize people in minority groups. And even though a few microaggressions are insignificant when taken in isolation, the steady stream of them can give people a strong feeling of othering. They send a distinct message that you're not normal, that you're less than, that you don't belong to the community. And the experience of microaggressions has been referred to as death by a thousand paper cuts. And the idea is that one paper cut is not really going to hurt you, but a thousand might kill you. So if someone comes to you and complains about like a small comment, it's easy to sweep it under the rug. But it's important to understand the impact of the aggregate of all microaggressions and the effect that all of them combined can have on an individual. Another challenge that I face and that a lot of minority groups face is erasure um, or being forgotten about, not credited for your work. For example, although software is a male-dominated field and most people identify programming with men, as I've said multiple times now, women actually invented programming. Ada Lovelace was the first to describe how computing machines could solve math problems in, eight, in 1800s. And erasure happens because the majority group has the power to write history and give credit to the contributions of minorities. So when we don't make a point to do that, we erase voices in history. And that's the whole concept of the smash film Hidden Figures, which is the highest grossing film of this Oscar season. It's the unknown story of three African-American women who were engineers at NASA and who played a huge role in one of the most important space, space missions in American history. It's a really awesome film that you should all see, and it's already inspired thousands of young girls to pursue um, science in school. And part of why talking about diversity is stressful is that we're afraid of making mistakes saying the wrong thing, being labeled sexist or racist or homophobic. Um, and so a key part of making positive change is being okay with making mistakes and learning from them. It's okay and encouraged to make mistakes. Just make sure that you acknowledge them and learn from them and try not to make the exact same mistake again. Building diverse and inclusive environments requires trust and openness and vulnerability. And so it's really important to create a safe space for people to make mistakes. And in the spirit of making mistakes and learning from them, we're going to debunk some common statements that people make about tech's lack of diversity. And all of these statements are things that I've said, or some of you have probably said, and all these statements are false. You can think of them as alternative facts. Um, so code is gender or race blind. I used to believe this, and that's what I thought I loved about code, right? Like, programs don't have gender or race. Like, when you're writing code, you're just evaluated by the compiler. But code doesn't run in a vacuum, and we have to take into account the cultural context in which we write and evaluate code. We write code on teams. It's evaluated by other people who have biases. And I learned this the hard way and eventually changed my name from Alexandra to Alex to be more gender neutral so I would stop getting harassed on code forums. I kind of look like that guy right now, I guess. <laughs> um, something else I hear a lot is, I would love to hire more women or you know, more people of color, but I don't want to have to lower the bar for my team. And I hear this a lot from really well-meaning people. And this statement is like not OK, because it presupposes that whatever group you're talking about is less good at programming than the majority group. And the truth is, when you hire minorities, you're able to raise the bar because you're hiring from a larger pool of applicants. Um, so some people say like affirmative action is just as discriminatory, but the idea behind affirmative action is to give a boost to those who have been pushed down by the system so that it ends up actually being fair and equal. So it's a way to counteract the invisible hurdles I was talking about. 
Another way to think about affirmative action is that people in the majority group have been receiving invisible boosts throughout their life, like in school, when applying for internships, jobs. So the boost of affirmative action simply aims to correct this imbalance. So now we have a basis of language to talk about diversity, and we know it's okay to make mistakes. What do we do to implement change in our community? So why are teams homogenous to begin with? In a lot of cases, it doesn't happen on purpose. We hire our friends, we hire people we went to school with, you know, our friends' friends, people who fit our culture, who we have things in common with. And so lack of diversity in a lot of cases happens not on purpose, but on accident. And diverse and inclusive environments happen on purpose, intentionally. And we're going to talk about how to do that now. And so the main question that we should always ask ourselves is, how can I rethink my company's hiring and culture in a way that provides equal opportunity for all? We're scientists. We love data. We pride ourselves on being a data-driven culture. So let's be data-driven with diversity. The first step to making any measurable change within our companies is measuring where you are. How will you know if you're successful if you can't measure how far you've come? And this means actually gathering diversity data on your team. And once you have that, you can set meaningful goals. At Skillshare, we recently collected diversity data and we made the choice to collect gender and race data only, just as a place to start. We gather data about what team people are on, whether or not they're a manager, whether or not they have a leadership role. That way we could measure to see if there's a glass ceiling, if people are being promoted equally. And this data informs the goals that we set. And just like any other metric, like revenue or DAU, you should set diversity goals. And an important place to measure data is your hiring process. If you find that you're unable to hire minorities, audit your hiring process and find out where people are dropping off. And there's a lot of other types of data you can gather to make better decisions, and I would really encourage you to visit Project Include to find out more. And once you've gathered this data, you can find out where in your hiring and in your culture, you're intentionally or unintentionally excluding people and you can change that. As Erica Joy said, inclusion is recognizing that there are systems to disfavor underrepresented groups at play in the workplace and working to counteract them. So remember that the root problem at the core of tech's lack of diversity is systemic discrimination. So in order to make real change, we need to change the system, change our hiring practices, change our interview processes, change how we promote people and iterate. So to recap, the way to build a diverse and inclusive environment is to find out why you care, understand that the problem is systemic, start talking about diversity, make mistakes and learn from them, measure your progress, and change the system. And it sounds like a lot of work, but if we can build self-driving cars, we can build inclusive teams. And together, we can change the narrative and our community for the better. And I'd like to close this talk uh, by a quote by Bever Beverly Daniel Tatum. This quote is specifically about racism, but it applies to other forms of discrimination. I sometimes visualize the ongoing cycle of racism as a moving walkway at the airport. Active racist behavior is equivalent to walking fast on the conveyor belt. Passive racist behavior is equivalent to standing still on the walkway. No overt effort is being made, but the conveyor belt moves the bystanders along the same destination as those who are actively walking. But unless they are walking, walking actively in the opposite direction and at a speed faster than the conveyor belt, unless they are actively anti-racist, they will find themselves carried along with the others. Our job now is to walk quickly and actively in the opposite direction. Thank you. I'm Alex Chin, and here are my tweets and stuff. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. Do you feel there's a difference between Europe and America when diversity is concerned? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. It's hard for me to answer that because I spent my entire career in the United States. Um, there's probably a lot of similarities in terms of the homogeneity of the tech culture, right? I can kind of just tell from looking at this room. Um, but there's definitely a, def a difference in the demographics of each continent, right? 
So some of the specific examples that I provided don't necessarily apply to um, a country like the Netherlands or to um, you know, the continent of Europe. But I do think from speaking to a lot of people from around the world um, that there, there is a, a lack of diversity in tech just in general, like no matter where you are. I think there's a lack of diversity, but on a positive note, uh, I'm a sysadmin, so we tend to be a little bit more in the background. Um, but I've never felt discriminated at all. In fact, uh, we are a minority, but I've only feel, felt, you know, encouraged to uh, to do this and to find your goals and to match up to the guys. And that's awesome. That's really <laughs> awesome. We have another question over here. Um, I would like to ask uh, if you could share, I, I don't want to make it into an uh, emotional um, statement from your side or personal, but um, are there moments that you felt supported and actively non-discriminated by white cis men? Yes, definitely. Could you share one, ex one example? Um, for example, okay, this is a great example. Um, I was conducting a technical interview maybe a year ago with uh, my white cis male partner, and or not partner, but like colleague. And um, in the interview, um, the person we were interviewing who was also a white man, would o was only speaking to my colleague even though I was asking the technical questions. He would answer them to my colleague, which was like very frustrating. Um, and you know, I wasn't gonna like, necessarily say anything to him but just like write in my interview like notes like you know I think this person did well for these reasons but this is a big red flag even though I was leading the interview they like essentially ignored me and I felt a little bit uncomfortable about having to bring this up to my engineering um, manager because this person had done really well in a lot of interview rounds um, and I, I felt uncomfortable having to be the person to bring this up but my colleague um, actually brought it up as well instead of me and like <coughs> provided the support of his privilege to lend um, you know, credibility to this claim. And we ended up not going with this hire because you know, we have a really diverse team and we need to be able to, um, we need to hire people who can work with everyone. So that was an awesome moment of allyship. Alex. Uh Maybe a strange question. Uh, from your examples, you see some companies who are actually not really attracting uh, a diversity uh, people. Is there a way companies can actually turn it around and being attracted or being attracting to these minorities? Yeah, there definitely is. And there's a lot of companies who are doing a great job of this. Slack, for example, is one of them. Um, I think a great way to do that is to um, kind of publicly acknowledge that this is something that you care about, which a lot of companies have done, and then um, do a lot of outreach in minority communities, support minority communities, um, and just like acknowledge that it's they're constantly working at it and um, continuously me measure their progress. Any other questions? Alex, thank you. Uh, I think you did a great uh, presentation focusing mainly on, uh, on the labor market industries, attracting people, but is there anything that you would recommend that we can do in the educational system in order to uh, fill the pipeline even further at the front? Yeah, definitely. Um, there's, I mean, there's a lot of ways that um, the educational systems are broken. Like there's been studies that have shown that um, teachers like intentionally or unintentionally like steer young girls and women like away from sciences and also you know set lower expectations for students of color so you know actively counteracting those patterns in classrooms is important um, but there's there's something that happens outside of schools that we also need to change which is um, like the images in media of like success and scientists and um, as long as those 
remain pervasive. It'll be hard to change the culture within schools. Um, but there's definitely a lot we can do in education, like, for example, um, Carnegie Mellon, or Harvey Mudd, sorry, Harvey Mudd is an, a really excellent uh, American university that has a big focus on computer science, and I think, like, 55% of their um, CS majors are women, and what they've done is that they've made computer science mandatory for all students. They've changed the names of like intro to computer science classes to have more like applicable context, so that even if you have no idea what programming is, you're still interested in it. And they've had like all female programming events so that people or women might feel like a little less intimidated by like going to a hackathon. So those are all things that we can do within educational institutions. Thank you. Um, Alex, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, incredibly clear, and thank you for sharing your story. I had a question. The example that you uh, provided of your coworker, uh, white cis coworker, that lent privilege uh, in that particular decision, I would love to hear your thoughts on should that feedback had been live in an interview? Should the feedback had been on the back of the interview, feedback to the person? Or do you believe that the method of that, that you followed on just uh, the panel was the best way to go? That's a great question, and I have I like ask myself those questions all the time. So every moment is a teachable moment, right? If someone is kind of exhibiting like offensive or problematic behavior in front of you, like that's an opportunity for you to teach them. Like you should generally approach a situation by thinking like I have the privilege of education. This person is not like ill-meaning, this person just maybe just doesn't know that like I'm a technical person and I can take this moment to educate them. However, as someone who spends a lot of time talking about this and who, you know, is like constantly like dealing with these frustrations, like so sometimes you just like pick your battles and you decide like, am I, do I want to get into an argument with someone potentially right now or am I going to just like, you know, fight for some other battle later. I think if I had had more energy that day, I probably should have said to that person like, hey, uh, you know, I'm leading this technical interview, like why, like, let's, why not let's have a conversation? Um, uh, you know, my coworker could have also mentioned that. Um, I do think we should strive to be our best and educate the folks around us when they make mistakes. Uh, but it's not always up to you to, um, you know, make positive change everywhere you go if you're a minority because that's super exhausting. More questions? Oh, it's on the wrong way. Thank you. I really empathize on everything that you say and I have to fight the same battle every day. I was just wondering, I'm considering dropping out well, at least once a week. What was it that made you kept going? Well, I'm a little bit arrogant person and I felt like I just deserved my spot here, which I think is just the truth and so do you. Um, I don't know, I, I just loved it. You know, I wasn't gonna give up yet. So I would, I would encourage you to keep going if it's something that you really care about, um, but to just do also what's best for you. Thank you. Any more? Nope. All right. Thank you, Alex. Thank you.